Hi, I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf and welcome to my podcast, Cleaning Up the Mental Mess. In today's podcast, I interview Professor Joanna Moncrief, who's a professor of critical and social psychiatry at the University College London and a consultant psychiatrist at the North East London Foundation Trust. She's one of the founders and the co-chair of the Critical Psychiatry Network. Her research consists principally of a critique of mainstream views about psychiatric drugs. She also writes about the history of drug treatment and about the history, politics and philosophy of psychiatry more generally. She's currently leading UK government funded research on reducing and discontinuing antipsychotic drug treatment and collaborating on a study to support antidepressant discontinuation. She's the author of numerous papers and several books, including The Bitterest Pills, The Troubling Story of Antipsychotic Drugs and the Myth of the Chemical Cure. We specifically talk about the dangers of medicalizing misery, the difference between the drug-centered model versus the disease-centered model of how psychiatric drugs work. We also talk about the unscientific myth of the chemical imbalance theory, withdrawal effects and how to withdraw from psychotropic drugs. And we touch briefly on the potential dangers and lack of research in psychedelics. But just before we begin, I want to remind you that if you want to listen to my podcast ad-free with bonus content and live Q&As, then subscribe to my Patreon account. The link and details will be in the show notes. And as always, these podcasts are for educational purposes and are not intended as medical advice. And if you need medical advice, please contact the appropriate medical professional. And now, on to today's podcast. Dr. Joanna Moncrief, you are seriously one of my heroes. You are an absolute leader in this field when it comes to understanding the impact of a drug versus disease, disease-centered approach. I have learned so much from you. You are quoted so much in when I speak. It's phenomenal what you've done. As a psychiatrist, as a clinician, as a researcher, you are really changing the world. And thank you for your work and thank you for coming on this podcast to help us understand more about what you do. Well, thank you for publicizing it, Caroline. Thank you, because sometimes I wonder if I'm talking to anyone or if I'm getting through at all. So that's nice to know. You are. You are. <laughs> Your message is being picked up by all kinds of people around the world, like myself, and, and you know, being put forward. And I think one of the things that I love most about you is that you're so gentle in your approach because there has been, you know, there's so many scary things that we can look at in this field. And it can be very overwhelming for people that, that are just lay people that, what do I do? This is what the doctor's giving me. What do I do about this depression? How yeah. do I understand it? And you have a very gentle way and um, of helping people understand, you know, what we need to know in order to manage our mental health, especially obviously when it comes to the drug, the drug side of things. So, mm-hmm. you know, thank you for that. It's amazing. Okay, so I'm going to start by saying you call yourself a critical psychiatrist. What do you mean by this term? I I suppose I mean that I don't sign up to the to what most people would see as the mainstream view of psychiatry that is that mental disorders are, you know, the same as brain brain diseases and can be treated in in the same way with with drugs or ECT or interventions that target underlying, you know, physiological or biochemical problems. But it's a term I think, I think, you know, other people would describe themselves as critical psychiatrists who might not have quite the same take on it. So it's a bit of a loose term. But for me, that's the essence of it. It's giving another angle on, you know, are we treating a disease or are we treating people in life kind of situation where I understand, understand your approach. And I think it's very important because if we're going to grow as a community and as a profession and as across the board, we have to be able to look at ourselves and see what we're doing right and wrong. And that's what science is all about, isn't it? I mean, it's an ongoing moving target. I suppose one of the things I want to emphasize is that human beings come in all shapes and sizes and we, you know, have, we're all different and we have a huge range of assets, but also a huge range of problems and difficulties. And I don't think it's often, I don't think it's helpful to call those things a disease or to think of them in medical terms unless we're really convinced that they are arising from a a specific, you know, abnormal brain process. I love that. And it makes me think of my training in the 80s where we were told that, you know, the brain couldn't change, but the good side of back then, and I know we shouldn't do the when we were back then kind of thing, but there was a definite distinction between neurological issues and people battling with the struggles of life and on a continuum. 
And that kind of blended over the last 40 years. And I watched that in, in the 40 years I've been in this. And that blending is a concern. So I see your work as being, you know, hey, let's just have, unravel this a little bit and understand yeah. that, the compl- as you said, the complexity of humans individually and the, the, the impact of life on them. Yeah, yeah. And it's not yeah, quite yeah. as simple as an underlying biological issue, even though we have to treat the impact, which is very often leading to gut issues or the multitude of things that can go wrong. So you're not eliminating that. It's just that we have to look at the, a better perspective, isn't it? I mean, it's looking at it from the right angle. Of course, you know, everything we do is reflected in our brain. So when we go for a walk, you know, you you could see bits of the brain lighting up that move our legs and and think, you know, where should we go? You know, reflect our thoughts about where, where we should go or what we're seeing and doing. But I think we need to distinguish that brain activity that goes along with everything that we do from, as you said, you know, a, a neurological disease like, you know, like a brain tumor or yeah. multiple sclerosis or something like that. So, you know, saying that that it's not a neurological disease doesn't mean there's nothing happening in the brain. And it doesn't mean that we can't influence what happens in the brain, both by what we do and how we live and sometimes by taking drugs. But we need to be careful about that, which is what, what no doubt we'll come on to. And that, exactly. And that, let's dive straight into that because you're probably best known for, besides so many different things, is for your drug-centered versus disease, mm. disease-centered approach. And I remember when I read that book of yours the first time, and all your subsequent books, it just was, oh, wow, this is the way yeah, we yeah. look at things. And yeah. it's just such a, it's brilliant. So please, would you mind going to as much depth as, as you'd like about explaining how you see drugs and just your approach and medicines, drugs, medicines, etc. Yes, yes. So I'll, I think I'll start off with just describing the conventional understanding of what psychiatric drugs do, drugs for mental health problems. So, So the conventional understanding is that for example, if you have depression, that the symptoms of, a dep- of depression are caused partly by some abnormality in some brain chemicals, possibly serotonin, possibly noradrenaline, possibly other things. And that when you take an antidepressant, it helps to rectify that underlying abnormality to some extent. And that is how it helps to improve the symptoms of depression. And what I've been saying is that we really have no evidence at all that that is correct. First of all, we have no evidence that depression, for example, is associated with any particular biochemical imbalances or certainly no strong strong evidence of that. And we don't know that the drugs are working in that way. And one of the reasons we don't know the drugs are working in that way is that the drugs like antidepressants and all the other drugs that we prescribe for mental health problems are what you might call psychoactive drugs, by which I mean they are drugs which change the normal state of the brain. They cross the blood-brain barrier and they change the the, the brain's normal physiology and, and neurochemistry. And because they change the normal state of the brain, they change people's feelings and thoughts and perceptions and sometimes feeling people's behaviors just in the way just in the same way that if you have a drink of alcohol, it changes the way that you feel and sometimes it changes the way that you behave. And it does that because it is changing the normal state of the brain. So what I've been saying is that in order to understand what drugs are doing, what what prescribed medication is doing when it is taken for anxiety or depression or, or any other mental disorder, we have to understand the sort of alterations that the that these drugs are making. And unless we understand them and factor them out of the equation, we can't possibly say that the drugs are doing anything else, that they're targeting some underlying hypothetical imbalance, for example. So again, I think it's easiest to, to, you know, to talk in terms of examples. So we know drugs that are commonly prescribed for anxiety are known as benzodiazepines. This class of drugs includes drugs like Valium, also known as diazepam, uh, Librium, Alprazolam, Xanax, and others which are, are well known. So these drugs are well known to be drugs that reduce the activity of the nervous system generally. And may, therefore, they're, they're sedatives, they make people feel sleepy, less aroused, less active, 
And if you give them to people who are very aroused and very worried, they can bring down that level of arousal and make people feel calmer. But they also they make people feel calm and a bit drowsy who people who don't have anxiety or don't have any particular symptoms. That's just what the drugs do. That's how they alter the brain. They reduce the brain's activity by reducing arousal in general. So in order to understand what a benzodiazepine does when it's taken by someone with anxiety, we need to understand those general effects that it has in anyone, regardless of whether or not they have symptoms of a mental disorder. So that's the drug-centered model. It's the idea that drugs are working by altering the normal state of the brain. And those alterations can interact with the symptoms that that people have, whether that's anxiety or feelings of depression. So another example would be thinking about depression. So, so many drugs, including antidepressant drugs, numb people's feelings to a greater or lesser extent. The SSRI antidepressants in particular have quite subtle effects, but people do consistently describe this sort of emotional numbing or or distancing, a sort of distancing from their emotions. And equally, when people come off these types of antidepressants, often people become sort of hyper emotional and tearful, as a, almost as a sort of rebound reaction, probably. So I think what's happening when people take antidepressants when they're depressed is is not that there's any targeting of of any underlying biochemical abnormality. It's just that the general numbing that is caused by this, these drugs, which would happen in anyone, is is happening in someone who is otherwise you know, feeling intense emotions and therefore may be experienced as a as an improvement. Although some people don't like that effect, so it's not experienced as an improvement for everyone. If you get breakouts, you've probably tried lots of treatments that haven't made the difference you're looking for. It can be stressful and frustrating to find something that actually works. You may not want to take antibiotics and you're probably disappointed with harsh teenage products. Finally, there is Glad Skin, a solution that supports healthy, balanced skin. Glad Skin is a new category of skin blemish treatment that works differently than any plant based or drug based product you've tried before because Glad Skin is based on the nature of healthy skin. Inflammatory blemishes and acne prone skin are caused by an imbalance in the skin microbiome. So, Glad Skin developed a revolutionary protein called Microbalance to restore the natural balance of the good and bad bacteria that live on the skin. Glad Skin Blemish Gel works without harsh ingredients, so it's gentle from day one. Glad Skin's products have been helping people in Europe for years and are now available in the US. Plus, there's a 60-day guarantee. Right now, Glad Skin is offering our listeners 15% off plus free shipping on your first order at gladskin.com slash drleaf. That's gladskin.com slash drleaf for 15% off plus free shipping gladskin.com slash Dr. Leaf. The link and details will be in the show notes. That's an excellent explanation. And that brings up so many other complicated factors about, and, and this is where we can go down so many routes. And the thing is, is, is the, the withdrawal effects, the long-term use, there's so many areas that you've investigated. So I like how you have said, you've very clearly distinguished between it's not addressing a disease, underlying biological disease state, we do not have research that says that even though that is the general perception of the average average person in the street and even most doctors, as you say very often, it's most doctors, are oh, that's what they've been told and that's what their training is at medical school. And unless you get into this and you really research it, you see that it's not actually quite what's going on, the whole disease model, that it's addressing an underlying cause. So I'd love for a moment just to talk a little a bit about the bias in the research and just a you know, sort of overview, and I know it's a massive topic, so yeah. if you can summarize that, and then maybe just let's transition over to these things. You, you're not saying to someone, don't take them. You're just saying, be very aware of it, and we could talk about that maybe yeah. a little bit more. But there is research questioning the effectiveness of this. There is no research saying it's a biological model, and there is research, not enough, but more, on the withdrawal and you know the, the whole concept of when you have withdrawal symptoms, oh, the disease is coming back, which is the common narrative of the average person who's using these types of these drugs. They're not medicines, they're drugs. So I know that's a lot, but however you'd like to unpack that. So, okay, so, so to start with the research, 
as you say, I think the first thing to be really clear about, because, because so many people and doctors don't understand this, is that there really is no evidence to suggest that what we call mental health problems, mental disorders, are caused by underlying biochemical abnormalities or any other abnormality that could be simply rectified with a drug or any other intervention. In fact, there's very little evidence that there's any specific biological thing going on in the brains of people who are diagnosed with various disorders that would distinguish them from people who don't have that diagnosis. An example is the research on brain abnormalities in people diagnosed with schizophrenia. The, that was thought to be the, the most consistent finding in biological research was thought to be that the brains of people who were diagnosed with schizophrenia were smaller and the brain cavities were larger than people who didn't have the diagnosis. Now, that finding has since been shown to be due to, at least in part, the drugs that people are taking, the fact that people with schizophrenia have been taking antipsychotic drugs for many years, which are associated also in animals with a reduction in brain volume. So that was that was the most consistent finding that distinguished people with a diagnosis of a mental disorder from people without. And that's been, been shown to be probably largely attributable, if not wholly attributable to, to drug treatment. So that's the first thing to say, that there really is no evidence that mental disorders are associated with any, any specific, as yet identified brain process. That then the second thing to say about the evidence on drug treatment is that the trials that have been done have that, that supposedly establish that psychiatric drugs are more effective, uh, are, are effective for mental health problems, are what are called placebo controlled trials. So they've all compared these drugs with an inert placebo tablet that doesn't have any noticeable effects. So that means that these trials are not distinguishing between whether a drug is acting on the underlying, on the hypothetical underlying basis of the disorder, or whether it's having these brain altering and mind altering effects that I referred to. That's what I call the drug centered model of drug action. I don't know that I said the name of it earlier. So these placebo controlled trials don't make that distinction. They just show that the drug is doing something a bit different from the placebo. And that could be due, due to the brain alterations, making people feel, you know, a bit numb, a bit, bit sedated, a bit less aroused. But it could also be due to enhanced placebo effects that are triggered by the fact that people realize that they're taking an active drug. Now, we do placebo controlled trials in order that people don't realize that they're taking, don't know whether they're taking the active drug or the placebo in order to factor out all the placebo effects that we know are associated with taking a pill. And we know that, that these effects are very powerful, that, that people's expectations of what treatment they get it can profoundly influence their outcome. So to give you an example, in the big trials that were done of St. John's wort, which compared St. John's wort and antidepressants and placebo, no differences were found between any of the treatments. But if you looked at, the, at what people guessed they were getting, people who guessed they were getting the St. John's wort or the antidepressant, people who guessed they were getting an active treatment did much better than the people who guessed they were taking a placebo. So people's expectations of what they're getting can profoundly influence studies. And because psychiatric drugs do cause these brain and mind altering effects, people can often, de often detect whether they're taking the active drug or the placebo, and therefore their expectations that are associated with taking the active drug will influence the outcome of the trial. So, so placebo control trials are biased because they're not properly double blind. They're meant to be, but they're not properly double blind because people can detect what they're taking very often. And they don't distinguish between whether drugs are having a disease-centered or a drug-centered effect. So that's just talking about trials of drugs for acute treatment, you know, a trial of an antidepressant if someone's acutely depressed or an anti-anxiety drug if someone's anxious. Then you also mentioned that there's a problem with the research on withdrawal of drugs. 
And that's very significant because people usually don't just take drugs for mental health problems for a few days or a few weeks. They often end up taking them for months and very often for years. And that is on the basis of trials that are set up and called relapse prevention trials. So they they look as if they're they're looking at the benefits of long-term treatment. But in fact, these trials, what they're doing is they're enrolling people who've already been established on long-term treatment. And then they're randomizing people either to continue on the treatment or to be weaned off the treatment, usually very quickly onto a placebo. And we know that coming off these drugs is associated with withdrawal effects in, in all cases, I would say, to some degree, even if they're quite mild. And therefore, these relapse prevention studies are probably at least partly detecting not the benefits of ongoing treatment, but the adverse effects of being withdrawn from a medication quickly. So, so this is another really important point that I think people need to understand that the research that establishes long-term treatment is really fundamentally flawed by, by the fact that all these studies use this withdrawal design. There are very few studies that even try and wean people off gradually. And there are one or two that have tried, but those we're coming to understand now that even if you wean people off in a few months, there's probably still a risk of significant withdrawal effects that are going to be likely to still, you know, bias the results of these trials. You also talk about the fact that even within you know, the short term effect, as you take a drug, it's impacting you. So it's not like it's you waiting three weeks for an effect. It's almost immediately that there is effect. You give the examples of opioids, that initial analgesic effect is fine. But then a few days later, you've got hypersensitivity to pain and the same yeah. thing with antidepressants. Yeah. And that's something that people aren't really told about the sleeping tablets. Yeah. You give another example of that kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I think that's really important. So there's this concept of tolerance that, that that if you keep taking a drug, your body gets used to it and starts to try and oppose its effect so that when you stop taking it, then your body sort of it starts missing the drug. And that's the basis of the withdrawal symptoms, that your body has changed. It's adapted to the presence of the drug. And as you said, this can happen within days of of taking a sleeping tablet we find that if you stop you know if you take a sleeping tablet for a couple of nights it may help you to get to sleep quicker but then if you stop taking it you'll find that that getting to sleep is even more difficult than it was before you stopped taking this before you started taking the sleeping tablet because of this withdrawal effect so this withdrawal effect is is often kind of presented to the public as the disease is returning yeah. And the disease has returned. So there's the implication, there's the underlying disease, as we've discussed in the disease-centered model. And now you stop the medication and you go off it and the withdrawal effects have been classified into that grouping, which is incorrect. And related to that, there's also with the placebo trials, there's so much evidence that there's so many, if you look at the significance levels, the, the drugs have, are very seldom that clinically significantly better than placebo. And, and people are not told those things either. So could you yeah. could you speak to briefly to both of those as well because I think they're quite important for people to understand. So starting with the significance of effects th that's a really important point. So if you look at all the antidepressant trials that have ever been done in the world which was done in 2018 in a huge meta analysis what you find is that just accepting the sort of you know mainstream story, the difference between antidepressants and placebo overall, if you combine all these studies and you put in as much unpublished data as we can get our hands on, the differences between an antidepressant and a placebo are very small and of doubtful clinical significance. If you compare, if you think of the differences, to, to go back, the differences are measured on depression rating scales. So a common one is called the Hamilton depression rating scale. Its maximum score is 54 points. If you're sort of reasonably severely depressed, you're scoring between, between 25 and 30 points. And the difference between an antidepressant and a placebo is two points. And, and that's been found as I say, in that very large meta-analysis, but the same sort of difference is found in all the other meta-analyses 
that have been done over the last few years. So, and, and that difference of two points on that depression rating scale is, in my view and in other people's views who've compared it to different ways of measuring the sort of significance of outcomes in depression, not unlikely to be clinically significant, unlikely to really mean anything or even be noticeable. It's got to be at least six points, but they're not even, isn't it? I think it's at least six points difference, but they're not even, they're passing them as, as effective on just two points. Yeah. And yeah. so this is once again misinformation to the public and the side effects. Very often you talk about the fact that the federal agencies that are passing the drugs are not looking, they're looking for this effect versus yeah. we've also got to look at the negative effects. What yeah. is the impact, yeah. you know, the side effects? You know, it, thinking about antidepressants, an effect that we know that antidepressants do do very effectively and very commonly is to suppress your libido and cause all sorts of sexual dysfunction. That, that is extremely common. And I can't understand how, you know, a, a very small difference in the Hamilton rate, depression rating scale scores, which is quite possibly produced by, you know, amplified placebo effects anyway, can possibly outweigh the side effects, in, including that very common side effect of sexual dysfunction. And we should mention that the sexual dysfunction has also been found to sometimes be persistent when people stop taking antidepressants. So this is, I think, a really shocking and worrying thing. We don't know how commonly it's persistent, but, you know, so many people are taking antidepressants that even if it's not very common, it, it, it might still be, it, it, or not, not very, you know, the risk isn't very high. It still might be very common because so many people are, are taking antidepressants. So, yeah, so, so, so I think there's, you know, with antidepressants in particular, there's a big question about how useful they are in the first place. They may have this, well, they do have this emotional numbing effect, but actually when you look at them in trials, they're really not outperforming placebo in in any way that, you know, enough that I would feel, many people would agree with me on this, that it would feel that really would justify their use. It might be a little bit different if you think about benzodiazepines for anxiety. They they have a bigger immediate effect. It's much more noticeable. It, they are very effective at reducing anxiety, but there's a downside with them as well. People very quickly get tolerant to them. And, you know, then when they try and stop them, they might find that their anxiety is shot up even higher than it was before. So the, the, there are downsides to them, but but they do at least have more robust, you know, immediate effects, more clinically significant immediate effects. So with, you know, with immediate effects, these are the, you know, if, you, if you're taking, if you're thinking about taking something because you're not feeling good at the moment, these are the sorts of things you need to think about, you know, how, well, what sort of alterations do these drugs produce? How, how do they affect the brain? Well, we probably don't know much about that, but that's something that we should, should know about and people should be asking about. And how do those brain effects affect how I am going to feel and, and my thinking processes, my emotions, everything else? And, you know, and might that actually be useful for what I'm going through? And then what happens if I keep taking it? You know, am I going to then quickly get dependent and tolerant to its effects and find that if I stop, I'm even worse than I was before I started? Those are the things that people really need to be thinking about when they are thinking about starting on a drug. So I was talking about these relapse prevention studies taking people off medication quickly and people experiencing withdrawal symptoms. And I think this is, as you were saying, exactly what happens in clinical practice as well, that people try and come off the drug. They feel awful because they're getting withdrawal symptoms. And either they believe, you know, that they think, oh, it must be a relapse or they're told by their doctor it must be a relapse. Everyone generally assumes that it must be a relapse. So then they go back on their medication then they feel better, of course, because the withdrawal symptoms are then suppressed. And then they conclude, oh dear, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fundamentally chronically ill and I'm going to need to take this medicine forever. And not only does that mean that people end up on medication for long periods of time that they might not have needed if they came off it slowly and carefully or if they recognized what was happening when they came off it. It also, I think, really really undermines people's confidence and really makes people sort of more fragile, more anxious, you know, demoralized because they tried to get off something, but, it, you know, but they failed. Um, they're never going to be able to, to get off their drugs. So I think it's, you know, it can be a really 
really difficult experience. And then if people, it, then if it's interpreted in this way of, oh, you've had a relapse, of course you've had a relapse, what did you think? You know, then that psychologically can be really damaging for people as well. So, so this issue of withdrawal is really important, really important for people to recognize that, you know, that drugs can cause withdrawal symptoms. I, I think they can cause them really quickly. But having said that, the longer you've been on a drug, the more likely I think it is that that you will get significant and, and challenging withdrawal symptoms. So always better to try and get off things as quickly as possible, in my view. So that, and to that end, you actually say in one of your uh, blogs, your blogs are excellent. We'll put the link to your blogs in the show notes, everything, the links to all of where people can learn about your stuff in your books. But you talk about if people, you know, you're not saying to someone, never take them. You're just saying have a very drug-centered and informed discussion. Mm -hmm. And you may not find that very easily with your local mm -hmm. primary care physician or GP. So there's a, it's, it does put a, a little bit of impetus on you as the individual, which is why I have podcasts like this, exposing yeah. people to your work and things to help them be more informed. And then you say as well, you know, if, if you're going to go, just keep it as short as possible, which you pretty much said now. It, it, maybe you're going through some mm -hmm. intense or you've had a terrible experience yeah. and you just need a bit of a edge yeah. to, taken off. Could you speak just for a few seconds about, you know, that so that people... Yes. I, the last thing I want people to feel is that, oh gosh, I'm I'm so bad. I've taken these things. We're not moralizing anything here. We're just trying to help people understand the the implications of, of what yes. drugs do to your body and how best to handle that. Yes, yes, absolutely. You know, there are, people can go through crises and as I said, drugs like benzodiazepines in particular certainly have, you know, really quite noticeable and relieving immediate effects. They, they're very good at relieving intense anxiety and arousal. And, you know, sometimes I think that it's absolutely fine for people to, to take those drugs for a few days. But it, it is really important that people try and keep the time that they're using those drugs to a minimum. I think, you know, most, most primary care physicians nowadays are, are aware of the dependency problems with, with benzodiazepines in particular. So, so I, I think they, they, they should support that sort of approach with those drugs. Antidepressants, I think doctors are far less aware that they are dependents forming, that people can become dependent and therefore doctors are, you know, less likely to encourage people to take them for a short time. And in fact, a lot of the guidelines say that people should be on them for at least six months or nine months or longer than that. I would say to people, you know, I would, I would discourage that. I would, I would encourage people if they feel that it might be useful to take one of these drugs literally just, you know, just for a few weeks, if you can manage that, just for limit to a, limit it to a few weeks, try and get off basically as soon as you feel, you know, a bit settled and stable again, because the longer you're on, you're on one of these drugs, the more difficult it will be to get off in, in the long term. Absolutely. And, and you've got to get to the root cause of why, where you got in the first place. You may need that little boost and then get off them before it becomes an issue. And on that topic yeah. of the, of the de antidepressants, it's taken a long time to even get the NICE guidelines to finally acknowledge. I think it was just last year that they started yeah. finally acknowledging that, you know, we can't, uh, antidepressants are actually a lot more dangerous than what they've anticipated. There's been a lot of concern and interest in this area in the UK. I, I think to some extent around the world, but probably particularly yeah. here UK, in the UK. Yeah. For sure. So a few years ago, a body called Public Health England, a state-funded body, set up a group to investigate dependence on prescribed medication, and it included not just benzodiazepines, which you might predict, and also opiates. There was concern about overuse of opi opioids. I know that's an issue in other places. But it also included antidepressants. That was really a seminal moment that, you know, put, put antidepressant dependence on the map. And they produced some recommendations. And, one, and, and, and from that, the NICE committee was set up to a, a, a special special NICE committee was was set up to look into dependence on prescribed medication and withdrawal from, you know, withdrawal effects after stopping prescribed medication. And alongside that, the NICE depression guidelines rewrote their, their section on coming off antidepressants to acknowledge that withdrawal symptoms were more common and more commonly severe than they had previously acknowledged and to advise that that withdrawal was done more slowly and carefully than they had previously advised. And we're still waiting for the, the special NICE Committee on Prescribed Dependence and Withdrawal to 
to put out its final guidance, which will probably be, you know, similar. It will acknowledge that dependence on antidepressants as well as all these other drugs is is common and that, that withdrawal needs to be done flexibly and carefully in order to help people to come off with the minimum of of suffering along the way. I think there've been a, a few, you know, a, a few bodies have started to acknowledge this problem. Also, I should say the Royal College of Psychiatrists have rewritten their guidance to help people who want to come off antidepressants. That was done with the help of a colleague of mine who's who's been very active in this area because he's had his own experience of of dependence on these medications. So so that's all, you know, and that, that's helped. Yes, yeah. And you've got you when you were emailing back and forth, you told me something that made me very excited that you are the NHS is, has actually appointed you to have I got this correct to start a an actual withdrawal clinic. Yes, yes. With with this same colleague of, of mine in northeast London where we work, we've set up a an NHS clinic for people who want to come off prescribed medications, prescribed medication for mental health problems, but particularly we're looking at helping people who are we want to come off antidepressants and benzodiazepines. And we're hoping, we're set up in London, but we're hoping we'll be able to take people from other areas, although although the bureaucracy is all, all of the NHS is all a bit complicated, but uh, hopefully we will be able to do that at some point. Every morning I get excited for breakfast. This is a special time that I give myself to rest and prepare mentally and physically for the day ahead. And one of my favorite ways to wake up is with a delicious bowl of cereal, which is why I love Catalina Crunch, a yummy cereal that is zero sugar, keto friendly and low carb. They've got eight crave worthy flavors to choose from. Cinnamon toast, dark chocolate, chocolate peanut butter, chocolate banana, honey graham, fruity, maple waffle and mint chocolate. I personally love their honey graham flavor with a splash of coconut milk and cream every morning. But all their cereals are also really delicious with a spoon of creamy yogurt or ice cream for dessert after a meal. My husband loves the maple waffle cereal on top of his vanilla ice cream. Catalina Crunch is great for anyone who wants a nutritious way to enjoy their favorite snacks. If you're trying to just eat a little bit better in 2022, Catalina Crunch cereal has the crunch you crave without any empty carbs. Plus, it packs a whopping 11 grams of plant-based protein and 9 grams of fiber per serving. And all these cereals are gluten-free, grain-free and non-GMO. Catalina Crunch use only the best ingredients, real ingredients, nothing artificial. No wonder they have over 10,000 five-star reviews. See why Catalina Crunch cereal is the fastest growing cereal brand in America. Just go to catalinacrunch.com forward slash Dr. Leaf for 15% off your first order plus free shipping. That's catalinacrunch.com slash Dr. Leaf. Not sure which flavor to start with? Try a variety pack and check out their delicious cookies and snack mixes while you're at it. Again, that's catalinacrunch.com forward slash Dr. Leaf for 15% off your first order plus free shipping. The link and details will be in the show notes. It's a model and it'll be a start yeah. and other countries will that are in, you know, have, have the same approach that you do will hopefully come and learn and set up similar clinics and things. Yes. Because people often ask me, and as I say, I refer to your books, how can we, how can yeah. we get off medication? Yeah. So I'd love us yeah. just to talk a little bit about things like taping strips, because there's been great work around that, that Dr. P- yes. Peter Groot yes. and, Groot. Yeah. Groot yeah. and yeah. I mean, you were yeah. talking about Mark Horowitz, I assume, and yeah. you know, there's yeah, yeah, just yeah, great, yeah. there's just yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. And I get, yeah, just yeah, the other day, yeah, someone, yeah. So, sorry, sorry yeah. just the other day, someone was emailing me and saying, you know, this person that's very close to them wants to get off, but there's, where do they get taping strips? You know, and I'm here, I'm searching yeah, through yeah. everywhere, trying to find an actual pharmacy yeah. in the state that will yeah. make a decent taping strip. So that's, would yeah. you mind talking a little bit about the process and taping strips and what you hope to do in your, in your clinic? So the, the clinic will start with people coming in for a, a, you know, a comprehensive assessment, obviously, to work out what, what they've been prescribed and how long they've, they've been on them for, uh, been on all the different drugs for. And I'm saying different drugs because quite a few of the people we see are on more than one type of drug. So the first question is, what drug do you want to get off most? What do you feel is is the most damaging or most limiting to your life? And then we'd make a plan with the person to, as to how to how to reduce that drug. So Dr. Horowitz's work has shown that, although in fact we we knew some of this already from the work of Heather Ashton back in the eighties and nineties, that you can reduce the sort of higher doses much more quicker than lower doses. 
So if if people are on high doses of of drugs, then they can taper down to a lower dose relatively quickly over a period of a few months. But then when you get down to the lower dose, it's, it's when people often get into difficulty. And that's when you might well need tapering strips or liquids. Liquids are, are also very helpful. People can, you know, measure up and down with the liquids, you know, if they take it down too much and they get bad side effects, they withdrawal effects, they can then put it back up again and go down by a smaller amount. The tapering strips are doing something similar. They're measuring out very small amounts of the different drugs. As you probably know, if you know, if your readers write in with these sorts of problems, you know, at the moment people are struggling with doing things like opening up capsules and counting out beads of the drug inside the capsules because some drugs like venlafaxine, for example, come in relatively large doses. The smallest dose is still a relatively large dose in biological terms, in pharmacological terms. And you can't even break, it's not even a tablet, so you can't even break it in half. So people are, you know, left with opening capsules and counting out beads. And that's often how people get down and off drugs like that. So that's our approach, really, to take a flexible approach, to come down come down off the higher doses a bit more quickly and then and then slow things up as you get to the lower doses. We don't generally recommend switching drugs if people are on antidepressants because antidepressants are they're a bit of a rag bag of different drugs, although even the even the drugs that are called SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, are actually still quite a bit different from each other. So if if you're coming off a benzodiazepine, the classic advice is to go on to diazepam, which is long acting, and therefore, if you come off it slowly, you you should, in theory, have fewer withdrawal effects. You should be able to get a smoother reduction. So people coming off benzodiazepines often convert onto diazepam. Plus, diazepam comes in a cheap liquid form, so you can titrate it down very slowly. But with antidepressants. The the general feeling seems to be not to swap, just to just to stick with what you're taking and try and reduce that. Because if you swap, often you're not swapping to the same thing, and you'll still end up with withdrawal symptoms, and then you'll be on something else that you've got to get off. So maybe even more complicated. So we're doing that. Then then what we're we're hoping to set up in the future as well, alongside the you know the advice with on tapering and support with tapering so we, you know we we'd do an initial assessment we'd come up with a plan we'd get people to monitor their withdrawal symptoms so that they can hopefully see that when they've made a reduction the symptoms may increase a bit but then they'll come down as the body readapts to the lower dose so we're doing all those things then we're hoping possibly in conjunction with a research research bid that we're developing to set up a peer support group because I think that seems to be something that find, people find really helpful. Again, in this country, we've got some amazing people who have either been through this process or some are still in going through the process who are really informed, really helpful and really supportive. And we're hoping that we'll be able to recruit some of these people to actually run a peer support group or, or or come and you know do do talks at, at a peer support group for people who are in our clinic to give them you know give them some inspiration hopefully as well as some everyday tips because as you probably know you know people who are going through this yeah it's very difficult for them to find information so often people find that you know support groups on the internet are the best, best source of information they can find and it's a, there's a couple of million survivor sites and, and there's so many great websites like to Sam, to Sammy to Mimi and, and there's so many people like yourself that they can actually get information. So it's become a process of, I'm hearing you saying with your clinic, it's education process. You're going to educate them, help them understand that those mm. symptoms you're experiencing are not the disease returning, but the brain adapting yeah. back yeah, yeah, to, and the yeah, body yeah. adapting yeah. back. And then also educating themselves. And there's definitely a move now where people are saying, hey, I don't want to live like this. There must be a better way. So, yeah. the, you know, going to this peer, peer support, I love that you're doing that. You've also done work with your radar study, looking at antipsychotics, and you briefly spoke yeah. about them earlier on and just how yeah. you know, the, the brain volume yeah. change and the long-term yeah. effect, because there weren't any decent long-term studies. Could you talk very briefly 
about yes. the radar study because yes, I think that's... I, I, I will just, just let me briefly mention another study that's going on in the UK though which is about antidepressants because it just relates to withdrawal and tapering strips and things so so there's a, a study called the reduce study which is being led by a GP called Tony Kendrick in the UK and I'm in, involved with as well and as part of that study a computer program has been developed to help people who are coming off antidepressants again to give them information about withdrawal symptoms about the withdrawal process and, and how they can do it, as well as some sort of simple CBT techniques, relaxation techniques. And that is also supplemented by a telephone service, not, not quite counselling service, but just a service to sort of monitoring service, exactly, yeah, just to, to give people a bit of support and monitoring. So, th so that trial is going on in the UK at the moment. It's st still ongoing. They're still recruiting and they're comparing that package of the computer programme and the telephone support to usual care with your, with your GP, with your primary care physician or GP. That's great that that's going on. And then I'm doing, I'm leading a study called the RADAR study, which is for people who have a diagnosis of schizophrenia or a psychotic, a, another psychotic type of disorder. And it's looking to see if we can help people who are relatively stable and who, who've, you know, had a number of episodes over the years, but are now in a relatively stable position to come off their medication or at least to reduce it significantly. So we recruited about 250 people. We finished our recruitment. We're still doing our follow-up. We've, again, compared people who have usual care, that is, stayed on maintenance treatment with people who've had a gradual program of antipsychotic reduction with their clinician. And we're looking, obviously, we're looking to see whether there have been any deteriorations, whether people have had any relapses or admissions, readmissions to hospital. But the main thing, our main outcome is actually social functioning because there's some evidence from other studies that people who manage to reduce antipsychotic medication and not be on it continuously long term forever actually do better in terms of their general functioning than people who continue on medication. We're, we're initially, we're looking at people over two years. These effects have generally been shown over a longer period, so I don't know whether we'll show benefits over our two-year period, but we are doing a long-term follow-up, and that's that's when I, I hope that we might see some improvements in social functioning in people who've had a, a gradual reduction and managed to reduce their, their dose of medication. Well, that's really good news because there has there haven't been enough studies in this area, but the few that have been done, it definitely seems that the more that sooner you get off, the sooner you can return to back to a, a fairly <clears throat> yes, normal. Yes. If, I hate to use the yeah. word normal, but you know yeah. what I mean, sort yeah. of yeah. a life where you can fit in with the struggles of and deal with the normal struggles of life and in the most yeah. beneficial way, kind of thing. Is it just? Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. I think a, I think that's right. I always say I think there are people with those diagnoses with these, you know, serious mental health problems that probably do me need medication for the long term. I think there are probably people like that. But if you don't need medication for the long term, and we know that some people, you know, just have periodic episodes and then then come out of it, taking that medication for years and years is is likely to be, you know, limiting and impairing to you. You know, so I suppose the point of a study like the radar study is to is to see if we, you know, can help people come off so that we can make sure that people are not on this medication who don't need to be. There probably will be some people who come off and, or try and come off and actually they can't manage it. But hopefully there will be some people who who can get off and, and, and are better off for, for that. But does it seem that percentage of people that do maybe need some sort of long-term support is not as big as what we, there's a picture is painted well, out there and we don't know? You know, the conventional practice at the moment is well, for many years was to put everyone on long-term antipsychotic medication. Then more recently, if you've just had one episode, then services will try and see if you could, you, you could come off. But once you've had a couple of episodes, generally the approach is that no, now you should be on medication for life. Even though, as I say, we know that, you know, some people have, you know, just discrete episodes and may not even have that many of them. That was the the approach. So in 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 theory, it should be possible for, for lots of people who were previously recommended to stay on medication, not not necessarily to have to be on it forever. The difficulty is, of course, 
as we were saying before, you know, once people have been on medication for a long term, long time, their brain has adapted to it. So it's not necessarily that easy to get off medication, especially if you've been on it for years and years. And the worry with antipsychotic medication, and this is the same with mood stabilizers for people with bipolar disorder, is that the process of withdrawal might actually trigger a relapse. It might not just be that you're getting withdrawal symptoms. It might, you know, those withdrawal symptoms might trigger a relapse of the underlying problem. So it's been shown in people who have a diagnosis of bipolar bipolar disorder, the old manic depression, who've taken lithium, it's been shown that people who stop lithium are more likely to have a relapse after stopping lithium than they were before they started on lithium. So it's something about that period after you've stopped treatment is a sort of high risk period, probably because of all the changes that are going on in your brain once you've stopped taking the medication. That's a concern, I think, with people who've been on antipsychotics for many years. That's why we have to, you know, reduce people very slowly and carefully. Maybe it won't, be, you know, it won't just be a smooth thing. Maybe people will have relapses along the way, you know, before they are able to either get off or get down to a much lower dose. If we want to be healthier mentally and physically, One of the best things we can possibly do is get several hours of quality sleep every night. The brain and body heal itself when we sleep. It really is one of the most amazing processes, even if you're not conscious when it happens. But I know it's hard to get good quality sleep sometimes. Your mind keeps you awake, life is stressful, and there are often a hundred anxious reasons why you can't fall asleep at night. Thankfully, there are also ways we can improve our sleep quality and overall health, including taking magnesium. Believe it or not, around 75% of people don't have enough magnesium. No wonder so many people have sleep problems. But please do not run to the store to buy the first magnesium supplement you find. Most magnesium supplements use only the two cheapest synthetic forms. And since they're not full spectrum, they won't support better sleeping habits. There are actually seven unique forms of magnesium. And you must get all of them if you want to experience its calming, sleep-enhancing effects. That's why I recommend Magnesium Breakthrough by BioOptimizers. Simply take two capsules before you go to bed and you'll be amazed at how much better you sleep and how much more rested you feel when you wake up. For an exclusive offer for my listeners, go to www.magbreakthrough.com forward slash leaf and use Dr. Leaf 10 during checkout to save 10% on your order. The link and details will be in the show notes. It's also interesting if you look at that, I mean, it's such significant work. Look at the third world countries or the areas that places that can't afford to have those medications. They manage psych- psychotic events so differently and still mm-hmm. manage to mainstream back into the into their community with so much community support. You know, and that's something that in the R very westernized culture or whatever we just have forgotten a little bit about that well yeah. i'd love your opinion on that but if we, we need to yeah, yeah, look at those yeah. things coming from africa this is what i saw a lot you know and it's an interesting point really really interesting so so you're referring to the who studies the, the who did two really important studies one in the 70s one in the 80s which looked at the outcome of people who were diagnosed in schizophrenia with schizophrenia in different countries around the world. And much to their surprise, they found that people from third world, less developed countries had better outcomes than people in the West, even though people in the West had access to, you know, all the modern medication and, and modern mental health services. And there are, you know, different thoughts about why this is the case. And I'm sure that one of the reasons is, like you say, better integration back into the community and and more of a role for people, I think, in those communities. So I really like a book by an author called Ethan Waters. I don't know if you've read it called Crazy Like Us or heard of it. I haven't. I've heard of it, but I haven't read it yet. So I will There's make sure. There's a very I'm... interesting chapter on a family from East Africa who have a daughter who has a, 
we would we would have diagnosed her with schizophrenia or some sort of psychosis in this country and and it's all about how the extended family and the whole community helps support this young woman and how when she's well she takes part in you know she she helps out with the family she helps out with childcare when she's unwell she's allowed to sort of retreat and withdraw and there are other people to fulfill her duties so she's sort of well integrated and and her periods of being unwell are are managed and accepted so so yeah so so i think that's uh, that's an interesting example the other explanation for the findings of the who studies has been suggested to be you know the damaging effects of putting everyone on long term antipsychotics you know possibly it's also due to the fact that that actually you know makes people less able to function and as i say if, if you're starting some people on these drugs that really don't need them or don't need them long term then overall you're you're going to you know have have worse outcomes than 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 countries that don't yeah that's so interesting and it's something that we need to consider some that's why i wanted to raise that and I, I, I know we've got don't have much time left, and we'll have to do part two. But I'd love to just transition to two things if we can handle them. If you've got five more minutes, is that yes, that's fine. Is that okay, yes. fantastic. Yeah. Okay, so and it's going to be hard to do these in five minutes, so we'll just do the best. I was so excited, and I'm sure you were about the recent release of the combined paper from the WHO and United Nations about the fact that we've got to look at you know Dr. Dana's Purus, and we've got to really yeah. relook yeah. at the whole social impact. I'd love your your opinion on this release where it's actually now looking at we can't just do the bio 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 approach we have to really do bio psycho social spiritual and look at the environment and the impact of environment which goes to a lot of the work that i've been doing in, in terms of a neuroscientific clinical approach and environmental approach to helping people manage so i'd love to just hear your opinion on that and if you felt as excited yeah. as i did that maybe yeah. there's some hope I think it's fantastic, you know, and and so important that the you know a, a, a body like the UN has emphasised this psychosocial approach, the psychosocial aspects of these problems, and you know, and said in black and white, we are over medicalizing things. We're focusing far too much on on the idea of of these conditions as biological problems, which is not a helpful way to see them in most circumstances, and we need to pay more attention to. To people's context, that's what's really important. You know what we're what we're dealing with is not people with brain diseases. We're dealing with people with a whole variety of life problems that relate to their own individual circumstances. So you can't make sort of gross generalizations about depression or anxiety or any of these things because everyone's depression is unique to them. It's a reaction to their own unique circumstances, their own unique lives. Um, so, so fantastic that the UN have come out with this document. On the other hand, it it feels like there's a huge gulf, really, still between you know w- what what's in the document and yeah, and and what the services are doing, and the fact that you know people are still consuming more and more antidepressants. Lots of good things are happening in the UK. At least there's there's also a big social move towards social prescribing, encouraging you know GPs, general general practitioners, primary care physicians being able to prescribe things like you know going to the gym and exercise class, something like that for people instead of in, instead of medication. But you know, but we still use we're still prescribing vast quantities of antidepressants and all these drugs. So it's it feels like there's a it's big still gap. a huge yeah. gap. I yeah. agree with you. Yeah. I agree yeah. with you. Yeah. Yeah. And then and I, I know suppose th- also it's just also that the services still feel very medical. You know, they're, they're even the social prescribing has been done by the GP. And I I often think that we really we need to get these services out of medicine and, and and put them into social services maybe somewhere else it that is happening with some of the child and adolescent mental health first tier mental health services in this country are generally now located in social services so it is possible to do that and i think you know and it doesn't mean there can't be some medical input it's more a guideline yeah I agree with you, and that's where Professor Peter Kinderman, uh, someone we both know a lot about, um, right, right, he's trying yes, to. Yes. He's done. A, he's been great in terms of trying to get that to happen. But you definitely, yeah. the UK is ten steps ahead. Now, this is really a question I'm going to just start, and I have to answer, get a little answer, and then do the deeper at a further time to respect okay. your time. And that's the transition to the crazy trend that's currently happening. Just to quote you, the new crazy trend of psychiatry, which is looking at esketamine and ketamine and 
psychedelics as you know the next you know the next wave yeah, of how to help people yeah, with mental yeah, yeah. health and yeah. just the dangers and you have excellent blogs and I know you don't have much time but is there something that you could just an overview you could give of that potential danger and how we should be looking at psychedelics yeah, yeah. well I think this brings us back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the podcast the research the science we need to look at that very carefully because like you say everyone's got terribly enthusiastic about this but actually if you look at the studies well first of all it's impossible to blind for taking something like a you know a, a psychedelic drug so you need to bear that in mind and secondly the studies really aren't showing that they're doing anything very fantastic either the, the esketamine studies uh, are not showing any clinically significant benefits. The psilocybin study recently didn't find any any effect for its primary outcome. So, uh, yeah, I think I think we need to really sort of be very wary and cautious about this. The research is not showing any benefits. We know there are some, you know, dangerous adverse effects, particularly for ketamine. We can maybe discuss this more in a in another podcast. And then I think there's also the danger of, you know, of of getting people hooked on an, another procedure, another sort of some, something that might appear like a, you know, like it's going to be a, a quick fix, but but probably isn't. And the long-term life isn't a quick fix. It's an ongoing long, long process and there is no quick fix. So we definitely, let, let's have a, I just wanted to mention that and we'll definitely do that in another podcast. Yeah. And I'm going to end with this, just a, a comment, basically. You, you are one of the people that first coined the term, I believe, of medicalizing misery which I thought was absolutely brilliant and something that I have think I've been saying since you first said it to people, Dr. Jan, I have a slide yeah. in my slideshow <laughs> that we mustn't medicalize misery. And I think that's probably almost sums up your whole approach. So just in closing, you know, around that statement, what, you know, what would you, yeah. what would your sort of closing statement be, which is just the transition to the next time that you're on our show. So, so I think coming back again to a point I made at the beginning, really, that you know, that we're all different. And another phrase I like is that someone else coined was the idea of, this was applied to schizophrenia, but the idea of schizophrenia as being a way of being human. And I, I think that's the same with all our mental health problems. You know, they are ways of being human. So it is human to be depressed, to be anxious, to have some autistic traits or some, you know, attention deficit problems. These are human problems. We need to find holistic solutions. We're not going to be able to tweak the brain to get rid of these. Oh, that's so brilliantly said. And where can people get hold of you with the best links that we can put in our podcast? What would be that? I know you've got a great blog and website. Uh, so, 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 so my website, yeah, my website. I also write on the Madden America website yes. sometimes. But yeah, my, my website's the best place. Best place to find out more. Yeah. Well, I cannot thank you enough for your time, your valuable wisdom. I can't wait to continue this, this conversation. and. Thank you for all the incredible work you're doing. And it is going, it is having impact. It is reaching people and it's going to have a very, very long-term beneficial effect in helping people not medicalize misery and help them to be human again. So thank you so much for thank joining you. me today. It's been incredible. I could, I mean, I can't believe this hour has gone. It feels like five minutes <laughs> <Yeah>. for me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. I hope you found today's podcast interesting and helpful. If you want more tips and help with managing anxiety, depression, and mental health, be sure to visit my website at drleaf.com and to sign up for my weekly newsletter where I also include a schedule of my speaking events and so much more. And follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Just look for Dr. Caroline Leaf. Also, I love seeing all your posts on social media about this podcast. I love seeing what resonates with you and what you've learned. So be sure to continue posting and tagging me and letting me know what you think and how these tips worked out for you. And don't forget, leave a review and keep spreading the word about this podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I really hope you learned something new and helpful. Till then... I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf. This podcast represents the opinions of myself and my guests. The content here should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for educational and informational purposes only. Please consult your healthcare professional for any individual 
medical questions you may have. While we make every effort to ensure that the information we are sharing is accurate, we welcome any comments, suggestions or corrections of errors.